us. Make no mistake, we have enough love. So at this time, us. stand up and give a warm welcome and a round of applause to Dr. Halifa Sala. I do not go by the name Dr. Halifa Sala. I leave that to my brother, Dr. Sen. I have a different trajectory dictated by necessity. What I've seen here is the beginning of a beginning. Explorers travel all over the world. And wherever they went, they will look at the fruits, the vegetables, the environment, the trees, the herbs. And they spoke to people who consumed these things and took their diaries and started writing. As they moved, they picked seeds, moved to other land, and transported those seeds, experimented to see whether they will grow. And ultimately, they established plantations. And they saw what could be produced by those people where they went. But to take charge of the destiny of people and make wealth out of the labor of other people. They began to transport human beings to unite them with the plantations grew in abundance and transported their produce to be able to transfer them into manufactured goods. Thus began the triangular trade of transporting human beings, unite them with the land, take their produce to another land, process it, and come back to those same people again to get more human beings. That's how they build the wealth of nations. I do not have all the time to talk to you, but the message should be clear. that 3,500 B.C., when hieroglyphic writing became the depository of knowledge in Egypt, most part of the world did not reach that level of civilization. Writing, knowledge, constitute the basis of civilization. And what you are doing here is precisely what we should have been doing decades ago. To get people who are thinkers who will come and study what our people consumed. Study the history and begin to really examine what will ensure our survival, what will ensure food security and food safety. Now the World Bank, the United Nations, will establish decades for this, year for that. Then the NGOs will start and we will say that we are going back to educate our people. 
without doing research of what the people need. We teach without knowledge. How will we ever take charge of our destiny? If we do not become our own thinkers, talking to our people, gathering information from them, putting it together, testing them, and eventually make sure that we transform that knowledge into a way of life. Information must be converted into knowledge and knowledge into a way of life. That is the chain of civilization. That is the chain of development. So essentially, my purpose of being here today is to share with you the whole concept of Pan-Africanism. That's what I'm told. It's not an ideology. Pan-Africanism became a vision dictated by necessity. When our people struggled to be liberated, and we all know about the Jacobin revolutions in Haiti, from 1891 to 1898, a struggle of an African people alienated from their continent, but seeing the need to assert their humanity, took charge of their destiny in 1804 uh, in Haiti. From 1791 to 1798, there was that struggle of the Jacobin Revolution. What became clear to those who fought against slavery was the need to have the means of production to survive. Because if you are liberated without land, how will you survive? That is why liberation was linked to having the means of production so that you assert your freedom. There could be no liberation without having the means of production. But those who were removed from the African continent never belonged. They yearned to come back to their homeland. And movements develop for people of African descent to come back to the homeland. But when they did their research, they discovered that the homeland they wanted to come to was no longer the property of the African people. They were colonized. Order had taken over the land from the people. Africans removed from their land and taken to other lands, alienated from their homeland. Had to come together with Africans who were on the continent but alienated from the land to begin to strategize on how to get the land back to the people. That is why people like Sylvester Williams met in London in 1900 to begin to look at ways and means of building up the African identity because they had conditioned us to believe that we were an isolated race of people. That the human race had many races, superior ones and inferior ones. They had to battle against racism. To make others see us as human. Accept us as human. But eventually, it became very clear that people who want to take charge of their destiny must not ask for permission of others. They must not beg others to recognize them as human. They have to assert their humanity. But asserting their humanity was inconceivable without an identity, asserting their identity. So Pan-Africanism was meant 
to give the African an identity. To know that he, she has a homeland. And that homeland needed to achieve the right to self-determination and independence. And therefore, African nationalism must be resorted to to build that common bond of identity so that we can work as one block to liberate ourselves. And that is why from 1918 to 1921, Gavi struggled to implant that African identity in people at home and abroad. Over two million people became part of that movement all over the world to promote our right to self-determination and independence. Eventually, we all know what happened to him. His enterprise was derailed. And by 1925, when he was leaving this world, he indicated that he was just the forerunner of a people who had started to speak. And those people will never go to sleep again. And he was right. Because in 1919, even though people like Dubois wrote a petition to President Wilson so that in their negotiation after the First World War, he will introduce the concept of self-determination for the African people. But he didn't do it. But he did not relent. Dubois contacted Bless Jan, who was a deputy in the French parliament, because France wanted to assimilate Africans, to make them believe that they were part of France, because France suffered during the First World War and had to mobilize 100,000 Africans to fight for it and had to reward them for defending the self-determination of France that colonized them. So they had to appeal to Clemenceau so that he will agree for them to hold the first Pan-African Congress in Paris in 1919. They held that Congress and map out, charted out, the road to self-determination and independence. And you can see their declaration emphasizing the need to put an end to slavery and forced labor to ensure that those countries that were colonized by the defeated powers will never be subjugated again, but they should hold them in, 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 in a position of public trust. And that's why the League of Nations decided to hold those countries in positions of trust rather than total colonialism. They emphasize that the land of the people belongs to them and they must be assisted to use it as much of it as they need it to ensure their food security and complete control of their destiny. They spoke about building an education system that will ensure that their local languages are transformed into written languages so that they will be able to learn. A crop of teachers should be taught. And that education will not only concentrate on academic work, but also to learn a particular skill in order to unite both academic work and the acquisition of a skill. This is 1919. They emphasize that any investment, outside investment, must be ensured to leave back what will be utilized to promote 
general welfare, education, health. That they should never allow the African soil to be utilized by others for their benefit alone. This is 1919. We now have produced geniuses on the continent. But up till now, we are incapable of taking charge of our own affairs. In the Gambia, we consume about 200,000 tons of, of rice. We import 150,000 tons of rice, costing us over 1.9 billion in 2015. We had a program of self-sufficiency in rice, and we were not supposed to import rice again by 2015, 2016, but 2015, we could only produce 57,000 tons. But look at the land. What is keeping us from doing that? So we had to fight, ultimately, for the liberation of the continent from 1919 to 1945. In West Africa, there was the National Congress of British West Africa demanding for the British to ensure that taxation is linked to representation so that there will be local councils, so that they'll be able to control the local council and gradually they will be able to move towards independence. But the colonialists refused to relent. And eventually by 1945, it was clear that if they were just waiting for the colonists to give them independence, they will be there for the next century. They learned what Frederick Douglass learned, that power consists to no one without a demand. It never did, it never will. <laughs> power has to be taken, not begged for as a gift. So consequently, the liberation movement intensified until Ghana became independent in 1957. After all the torment of incarceration, of leaders. And when Nkrumah became independent in 1957, Ghana became independent. He asserted that the liberation of Ghana was meaningless unless it was linked to the total liberation of the continent. <clears throat> then the African liberation agenda expanded in 1957. By December, 1958, all the key liberation leaders assembled in Ghana in preparation to move to liberate their countries. They agreed that those countries will also send their young people to go to Ghana for further training in all disciplines. So African countries were beginning to be their brothers and sisters keepers. The agenda for the liberation of the continent intensified. By 1960, 15 countries had become independent. By 1965, 30 countries had become so the liberation movement was unstoppable but but what was planted in 1960 should have moved Africa beyond where we are because Nkrumah and Lumumba met in Ghana to agree to build a union of African states. To harmonize their resources. Work on a common agenda. Ghana struggled to develop energy resources 
dams even move towards nuclear production, the highest level of, of science at the time, to apprehend that science. Waiting for the whole of Africa to transform so that they will help each other, build each other up. Because it was inconceivable that Africa will be liberated without producing raw materials, without processing the raw materials, without building the machines that will process the raw materials. That is what economic emancipation means. But if you put raw materials, others process it. Still value added. You're going to be dependent because you will consume value added. They will take back what they have given you. If they produce the machines and you use it to process it, you must pay back value added, it will go back to them. So total liberation could only come by linking the three. And it was clear to him that that was necessary. That we have to create our own African investment bank, our own African central bank, monetary fund, so that we can promote inter-African trade and also trade with the rest of the world. But today you'll hear Africans, ah, yes, well, the West is playing with us, so now we're going to link ourselves to China. We are always looking for somebody to link to in order to think that that somebody is going to help to free us. When? I don't have all the time, I know. But you can see that the first thing that happened was the elimination of Lumumba. And since then, Congo is what it is. One of the wealthiest countries in the world is still incapable of harnessing its wealth to eradicate the poverty of her people. You look at this Gambia, this mighty ocean that we have, with minerals abound. Everywhere, fresh water. What do we need to feed ourselves? But billions and millions will be spent on so many different things. But still we are where we were. So the liberation project was stifled with leaders propping up everywhere, microstates, and each of them believed that they could go on their own without continental unity. So that was the end of the Pan African project. They saw it as an idealist project. But now still, we have gone nowhere. In 1980, leaders met. They quantified the wealth of Africa, the percentages of copper, of chrome, of diamond, of every mineral that Africa controls and talk about building up an industrial uh, decade, but no foundation for all those plans. Now we have the AU. They meet annually, but no comprehensive plan to be able to build an African investment bank, African central bank, African Monetary Fund, cooperation between states to see competitive advantages of each state and where they need to prop up to build up what we need as a continent, that agenda is still not in the pipeline. Today, there is Africa divided into five regions and now Six, they call it the diaspora. 
and those of you who are in the diaspora would constitute the sixth region of the continent. So what do we do together? That is the question. But for the present reality, instead of a continent with six regions, you have microstates with citizens competing. Citizens excluding even Africans from the neighboring countries, not to talk about Africans in the sixth region. People having narrow nationalistic conceptions, stifling the pan African, white pan African idea. And that idea was for Africa to take charge of our destiny in order to be part of the world family of nations, not to isolate Africa, but also to be an example to other nations and relate to them on the basis of equality. That was the prospect. So my conclusion is that this is the beginning of the beginning. We must interact again in diverse ways, looking at all the challenges of the sixth region. And here you're talking about our very survival. What do we need to eat to prolong our lives and reduce the health bill, which is increasing because of diabetes, hypertension, and all other forms of illnesses. And we do not produce the drugs, others will produce it. So it is necessary that we start afresh to begin the dialogue so that the second, second phase will now move to the third phase. First phase was identity formation. Our elders, our forefathers did that work and they went to their graves with their love for the continent. When Lumumba was arrested, he managed to write a letter. And in the challenge of the Congo, which should be standard reading in all universities on the continent, standard reading, you will read that letter. He owed no regret. He defied Adversity. Defied death. And challenge our generation to defend the sovereignty of the continent. So we have a responsibility to move to the third phase because they did the second phase of ensuring that at least the continent could be defined to be politically independent. But the economic emancipation, social emancipation, the eradication of all the backward traditions and cultures which hinders our unity, bar us from being together, and the interests which constitute the greatest tyrant on earth, interest, that personal interest, which makes people slaves, slaves to power, slaves to wealth, which alienates us from our people, kill our love for our country and our people, make us not to feel again. We see suffering and try not to do anything about it. We close our eyes to it. We must battle that greed, that selfish interest. That is only possible if our minds speak the language of knowledge. If our hearts speak the language of love. If our conscience speak the language of justice. We must unite or perish. Thank you very much.
We'd like to open up for questions. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Sheck and DeJoe's book, uh, Black Africa, case for Federated State. And I was wondering what your opinions of it uh, are. Well, I must emphasize that that has been the basis of Pan-Africanism. He is just articulating what the Pan-Africanists articulated since the 1900s. That the continent needs to be united so that we can harness the resources for the common good of our, our, of our people. That is, the, that is the only solution that we have. The starting point is, of course, each state having the leadership that will begin the process of building the type of people, the sovereign people who are united, who take charge of their countries and ensure that we have the policies that will advance the cause of the people. But united, we will be able to build the continent and united, we will be able to face the world and compel them to work with Africa on the basis of equality. That's the only way forward. Yes, Shia Ante is a great thinker. I see a lot of rhetoric about how do we do stuff internally? Uh, how do we worry about global warming? Uh, it is in my opinion, and maybe it's narrow-minded, I, I think our focus should be how do we get our way from externalities out there that want to come in and corrupt the governments? Uh, when you become a politician, you have good things in mind, and then you kind of have the wealth, the wealthier nations that come in and offer you these alternatives. Either you accept this lump, lump sum and become corrupt, or we'll take you out physically. And so my question is, shouldn't we be focusing on how to block these guys versus worrying about global warming or agriculture? Did you understand my question? Sir? I understand it fully. We must see the centrality of understanding everything that should be understood. Africa can never and should never try to isolate itself from everything that is happening in the world, but should instead try to understand those things more than those people and be able to chart a way that will guide others to follow what is in the best interest of the continent. But number two, it is important to realize that change must start from within. The internal conditions are the basis of change. And therefore, we must have a leadership and citizenship well prepared for economic and political emancipation. That is what we have not done. That is why our leaders, some of them became tyrants. They consume everything that we have and leave the people uh, in poverty. That battle then can only come to an end by empowering those people so that they, are, they see that they are the creators of leaders. And since they are the creators of leaders, then they will not worship those leaders. Instead, those leaders should serve them. So the democratic agenda of liberating the African people to become sovereign people is the way to prevent leaders from becoming tyrants and taking their resources at their expense. So it's, 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 it's a lot of battle, but the starting point is really the empowerment of the African people in each of the nations, so that they have national consciousness, a pan-African consciousness, but the duty of Africa in the world. Because any country, any people who shield themselves from others are a weak people. A strong people will never hide themselves from others. Rather, they will assert themselves so that they can be examples to others. Any more questions? Yes. Staying on that note of um, <coughs> empowering and being sovereign, if I look at Africa now, I would say that a lot of our leaders have failed us. You're right, they've become tyrants. If we really want Africa to change, is it not now time to focus on the young people and give them a different message to get a different solution to the African problem? The solution is to be a people. 
as I've always been repeating, the whole is not equal to the sum of the parts. Because that young person was a baby. That young person was not even born when the mother started to grow, when the father started to grow. We start to rear children before they are born. When mother and father decides that now we'll procreate to produce a person on this earth. That mother and father should plan for the child that is to come and how to bring up that child when the child comes. So in actual fact, is the whole architecture of our society that needs what you are actually saying to be focused on to see how the parents could be prepared for that young one who is coming. To prepare that person from early childhood, what facilities do you prepare, what do you provide? All the way to participate in taking charge of the destiny of the continent. We need that holistic planning which is yet to be done. And that is really the task for each to be placed where you should be placed in this agenda of transforming the continent and transforming the individual parts of the continent that is our individual countries at the moment. My conviction is that just like 1957 in Ghana, which started the second phase, I am convinced that in any single country where the right leadership emerges, the third phase will emerge because that country will be an example and others will galvanize uh, around that, 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 that example and that will move the country. Because we are looking for solution. The force of example will help us to find a solution. This is a group fully conscious of the need for Africa to transcend where it is today. But when you are effecting change, you must look at the level of consciousness of the people you are dealing with. Who are you trying to awaken? We all know that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King do not share a common origin in terms of thinking or school of thought. But if you look at the liberation of uh, the people of color in the United States, you must always remember Malcolm X. You must always remember Martin Luther King. Because what unites them is not their beliefs. What unites them is purpose. They saw suffering and regardless of the belief of the person, they wanted that person to be free from suffering and tyranny. So essentially what we must bear in mind is that in this agenda to transform the continent, we must take cognizance of the state, the social uh, being of every African uh, in the continent at the moment. Otherwise, the person will not even listen to what you have to say, even though that may be what will help that person to become mentally liberated. That is why in Latin America, seeing that their people were highly religious, began the whole concept of liberation theology. That is to get people who, yes, believe in the faith, but then direct their thinking towards real elimination of the suffering of the people. So in essence, 
if you are coming to the Gambia to discuss with the Gambian population about real liberation, you must take cognizance that 95% of them will be confessing to a particular religion, maybe 5% to another religion. And if you want to talk to them about the religion of their ancestors, they look at you and say that, well, maybe something is wrong with you. So in essence, that is not what connects you. Because they have already taken a position about what faith they are to belong. But then their poverty passes, their alienation passes, and when they leave here to go to Europe, they will deport them. They'll begin to face the same discrimination. They will not feel a sense of belonging. So as a result, we must build networks and break barriers. Build bridges, irrespective of our gender, ethno-linguistic origin, religion, region. That is the task now. Let's learn to speak the same language because all of us want to be free. And whatever inspires you to prepare the ground for our freedom, well, let that be. Take that as the basis of your inspiration. As Martin Luther King would see that, well, that was my inspiration. And we must go to the mountaintop to liberate our people. Gavi said, let's move to the hilltop and plant the flag, red, black, and green, and move our continent forward. They've always pushed the minds of people to something that makes us look at our greater good. I look at what will liberate all of us. So it is better to, to work on what unites us and leave aside what divides us so that we will not become more divided and therefore more dominated. That is really my conception under the circumstances.